Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Boudreaux with Manimit, and I want to thank you so much for joining us today to learn about Wimbrel and their incredible migration. I'm pleased to have with me today a fantastic panel of shorebird experts, Alan Neidel and Brad Wynn of Manimit, Mark Faraday from Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Sanctuary, and Dr. San Sandra Hiner, professor at the Central University of Venezuela. Uh, if you're new to Manimit, we are a nonprofit focused on empowering stakeholders through science. Since Manimit's beginnings in 1969, our work has branched out far beyond our Plymouth, Massachusetts-based bird banding operation. Over the last 50 years, our science and research have expanded to focus on ecosystem management and resilience, shorebird conservation, and educating tomorrow's leaders about the importance of the natural world. Diversity, science, and climate change are the fundamental principles driving Manimit's work today. I have just a couple of quick things to share before turning things over to our panel. Uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. If at any point during today's presentation you have a question, feel free to click on that Q&A box and enter it. We'll answer as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. And if you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, it is being recorded. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording within the next day or so. So thank you again for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn it over to Alan Neidel and the rest of our panel. All right, hello everybody. My name is Alan Neidel and I'm a staff biologist at Manomet and I help uh, lead some of our work with Wimbrels, as Chris mentioned. And we're very excited to walk you through some of our work that we do with Wimbrel, especially on Cape Cod, but also take a trip around the hemisphere with a couple of the birds we've been tracking. So just, I'll take just a moment to uh, give a background of some Manomet's shorebird recovery program. We um, tackle shorebird conservation through a series of science, site, uh, site conservation and habitat management, all working together to reverse the declines of shorebird populations throughout the hemisphere. Shorebirds are unique in many regards in that they are traveling a long distance all, the, all year round, going from their breeding grounds that are often up in the Arctic all the way down into South America. And conversely, there's shorebirds that are living and breeding all year round throughout the hemisphere. And throughout the world, there's a variety of different flyways is what we call them. And we here in Eastern North America reside in the Atlantic Americas flyway. And as you can see, there are several others around the world. Among the large group of shorebirds that range from anywhere from plovers to sandpipers to curlews, we are studying partic particularly the wimbrel, as you see here, which is representative of the tribe Numinius, which means new moon and is a member of the curlew group, which there are several species. Currently, wimbrel is the only extant member of the curlew species uh, tribe that is found in Massachusetts. So historically, species such as the Eskimo curlew, which is now extinct, and the long-billed curlew, which is now more restricted to Western North America, could also be found in Massachusetts. They are a priority for study, partly because they have a declining population in North America, the Hudsonian subspecies. And because of that, they've been identified as a conservation priority by many entities, including the Atlantic Flyway Shorebird Initiative, which we participate in along with our partner organizations. As you can see, the wimbrel is easily identified by its stripes on its head, its curved bill. We'll get into a little bit why that curved bill exists and also by its brown plumage. Since we're gonna focus a lot on Cape Cod today, which is right in Manowitz back door here in Massachusetts, this is some of the basic information that if you're into birds, you might already know about wimbrel that they are stopping over here from 
July to October, that first window of time is often when the adults are showing up and then later on in the season, uh, juvenile wimbrels start to show up as well, perhaps in early September and through the month of September, perhaps sometimes in August as well. And that's a staggered arrival of juveniles. So that right when the adults have moved through, the juveniles are traveling in all on their own, fully, fully grown and coming in. And so we refer to Cape Cod overall as something called a staging area or a stopover site where birds are gonna be here for up to a month, kind of in a mid, mid period in between the period of their breeding or natal grounds and then where they're gonna end up for the winter. And you might find them in salt marsh and beach habitat and they're feeding a lot on fiddler crabs. And yeah, the general window is July to October though, back when there were lots more wimbrels, they would occasionally show up in the spring as well, but that's generally a very rare occurrence these days. So this is a, a picture of a scene you might see in the Wellfleet marshes or somewhere in Chatham, where you can see the tall marsh grasses and the exposed mud banks. And there's some several wimbrel here. And if you look in the bottom left, you might see some willets as well, which are their close companions while they're here in Massachusetts, feeding on a lot of the similar food, food sources and showing that bold black and white pattern when they fly. And they also have a straight bill rather than the curved bill of the wimbrel. And they're often probing in those mud banks as you see there. So as I mentioned, they might be arriving, the first wimbrels, the first adult wimbrels might be arriving July 1st or so when the last juvenile's taking off around September 30th. And while they're here, they're investing a lot of energy in feeding. And you can see this very skinny bird here on the left is perhaps just bombed down from who knows where, somewhere in the northern, northern Canada and has burned a lot of its energy resources and is feeling the need to pack on the pounds once again. And so perhaps by the end of a bird's stay, it's now looking very rotund. It's been feeding a lot. And so all that is to pack on these energy reserves. It's like filling up a gas tank, so to speak, for a long road trip, except it's an air trip this time. And by the time they arrive at their destination, they'll be needing to fill up the tank again, so to speak. And I'm alluded to it for a second, but you might be wondering how they got so big so quickly. And while here in Massachusetts and a lot of locations on the, along the Atlantic coast and in the tropics, they're feeding on fiddler crabs, which is an umbrella term for several species that all have this distinctive, the males have this large distinctive claw. And if you've ever been tromp, tromping around the aromatic salt marshes, you might be seeing these scurry around by the thousands as you walk around. And the, the wimbrel has the ability to probe down into these fiddler crab burrows and extract crabs and flip them up in the air and down the hatch. And you just sit long enough, you'll just watch them do that all day long as long as the tide isn't too high and then they might have to settle in for a while. So, well, that's some more basic natural history knowledge that you could learn in most textbooks. We at Manomet are interested in doing science that can help further understanding and form conservation action for wimbrels and other shorebirds. And thankfully over the last 10 years or so, the technology that can assist us doing that has really proliferated. And in particular, we've been using satellite tracking technology to help answer some of these questions that aren't just readily observed by going out birding or observing just with your binoculars and scope. And so we've been using lightweight satellite tracking technology. These five gram transmitters are solar, solar powered and have a long and stock and they're attached kind of like a climbing harness where if you stepped through your legs and then secured it on the small of the bird's back and it weighs just about one percent of the bird's total weight which is an acceptable threshold to not um, encumber the bird's flight at all and that's brad and myself there working to attach a transmitter you can see the little solar panel up in the top left there and these transmitters are able to operate for up to four years and transmit data daily to us giving relatively specific information about timestamp, telling us what time the bird was at a location and location data up to about 100 meters accuracy. So 
Here's some sites of working out in the field in Wellfleet. Some nice uh, drone photograph, photograph of the marsh around Lieutenant Island, which is on the north edge of the Wellfleet Sanctuary. And some of our volunteer crew out there setting up some traps that we use to catch the wimble that help secure the bird's leg by walking through a small loop, which then if they walk across, it will tighten on their leg. And then we can walk out immediately and extract the bird. We generally set those up after several days of scouting where we figure out where the birds like to hang out. And then we do a targeted trapping there and run out and grab the bird and process the bird. And that is what we're doing here out on an exposed mud bar at the Wimbrels in Willett's Love. And so that's the site for any of you know, going out to Lieutenant Island, which is a causeway that's at low tide is a nice road and high tide is that's the same road and it's completely covered underwater by up to four feet of water at a really big tide. And so I'm out there scouting, looking for Wimbrel and uh, trying to figure out where to work exactly. And so we've successfully caught seven birds, uh, six of which were in the Wellfleet area and then one bird down in the Chatham Marshes back in 2015. And as you can see, these birds have given us a wealth of information. And that's really the beauty of this technology is that if you get your hands on just a few birds, you can end up with thousands of data points. And if you can just imagine how you want to gather this information 30 or 40 years ago, it'd be really impossible. And while we've learned a ton of things uh, that would be far too much to cover in one presentation, I will walk you through just a couple of interesting findings before we move on with the birds. And so, as, you, as I mentioned, you can take this information and do a ton with it. So in addition to just educating people and telling the stories of the individual birds, you can also start to identify some of these important resource areas. And I'll give you a little taste of that right now. So for example here, each color here represents a different bird. And for those of you familiar with Cape Cod, you'll see the arm of the Cape and then going up and up and down, north and south as the outer, outer part of the Cape and to the south is Monomoy and to the north is Wellfleet where you see a lot of those points. And each, bird each point represents a different bird and this is all raw data. So this might just look like paint thrown at a wall to you right now. But if you know that, if I tell you that each one of these has a time stamp and each one has a date stamp and so I know the time and day of each one of these and there's thousands of them with a little bit of digging, you can start to identify some patterns. And so here's one example. So knowing the daytime, nighttime, and the general idea of wimbrel behavior, the locations they are during the daytime are likely locations that they're feeding. And we can confirm this visually by visiting some of these locations. As you see, these yellow highlighted locations are all key salt marsh locations on the Cape where these birds are feeding on fiddler crabs. The northernmost part is around the Wellfleet Bay Sanctuary. That small yellow circle below there is around First Encounter Beach in Eastham, which some of you might know. If you go to the beach there, but then look inland, you'll see a nice salt marsh there at the outflow of a creek. And that is a popular location for Wimberl as well and confirmed by our data here. And then that small sliver of yellow down in the, the bottom is some marshes in Chatham, such as Forest Beach, which some of you might've visited before, which is one of these relic salt marshes that has uh, withstood the amount of development that's occurred on the Cape. So, and also a key and kind of unique among the shorebirds and wimbrel behavior is that they're in these feeding areas all day long and then they have a different sort of resource they need at night and that's a secure place to sleep. And so they're looking for a location that's free of predators and, and where they can have good visibility. And so, on the Cape, we've identified kind of two of these locations. One, the Cape Cod National sea Seashore that the First Encounter Beach birds and Wellfleet birds appear to be using out in a location called Jeremy Point, which is appropriately a very remote sand spur. And then also the Southern one is some small islands within Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge, which also provide a great roost location. And while those sites might also be roosting locations for bird roost during the day. If you go to either of those locations to the, during the day, you're unlikely to see any wimbrel at all because they're in the salt marshes. 
So only through this remote sensing data can we identify this sort of very important resource where the birds are sleeping, it's their bedroom. But without data like this, we'd have no idea that they were going there other than maybe being able to detect them in the evening. And so that leads me to this little video here. And that is Brian Harrington, um, scientist emeritus from Manamip and myself. And we are out in Monoy National Wildlife Refuge actually doing a monitoring survey of Wimbrel flying into that roost location that we identified. And so we were able to take our initial data and roll it into additional monitoring projects and being able to figure out exactly how many Wimbrel are using these roosts and hopefully monitor those moving forward and helping to tie into Wimbrel's Wimbrel monitoring efforts throughout the Atlantic Flyway. And on, I believe on that day we had about 350 Wimbrel coming into that roost, which by comparison is any given day, the Wimbrels are spread out in these salt marshes. You might only see five or 10 at a time. So it's really important to, to be able to count Wimbrels is to be able to identify these critical locations where they are um, concentrating to sleep at night. And so, well, I'd love to talk to you all day about data like this. I'd like to remind you that these birds are only here in Massachusetts for each individual for maybe a month at a time. And after that, we suspect, of course, that they leave because if you go birding in November or December, you don't see any wimbrels on the Cape and you don't see any willets and you don't see many shorebirds at all. But where are they going? And here are some out of the five birds that we've had successfully depart the Cape, whose transmitters continue working long enough for that to occur. We've had a pretty consistent pattern, as you can see here, of departure direction and destination heading to the north coast of South America, except for one bird, which settled into the British Virgin Islands. And you can see the most departures occurring around in late September or early October. And just as a reminder for any shorebird neophytes on the webinar, this shorebirds aren't like eagles or ducks. They can't soar and they can't sit on the water. These birds are flying nonstop, flapping constantly and doing this entire flight without stopping. And that's, you know, 4,000 miles or so, which will take up to four or five days without stopping. And we suspect they're probably flying in flocks and hopefully encountering good weather, preferably a tailwind to help them fly a little bit faster. And so that ends my kind of introduction Though you'll be hearing more from me later. And I would like to pass pass the screen off to Sandra Giner in Venezuela, who's gonna be able to, is uniquely positioned to be able to tell us a little bit more about shorebirds in Venezuela, in particular wimbrels, and also some of the threats they're facing down there to help give you a picture of what it is like for you know, the th three birds that we've had that have settled into Venezuela after departing the Cape. So. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you, Alan. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in the webinar. I will talk a little about the stopover sites used by shorebirds and the main habitat used by wimbrels in Venezuela. The next, please. The coast of Venezuela extends along three thousands. 1984 kilometers with many coastal marine ecosystems that include a big diversity of habitat used by shorebirds, such as in the tidal mudflats, salt marsh, salt flats, mangroves, sand flats, and rocky littoral. The mangroves area over the coast is about 8,530 square kilometers, and the largest extension is in the Orinoco River Delta. In Venezuela, there are 48 species of shorebirds, of which 35 are migratory. Next, please. One of these species is the wimbrel, registered in 85 locations along the entire coast of the country, mainly between August and May, but there are registered every month of the year. The knowledge we have about shorebirds come from several sources 
that include Waterbeer censuses, research from projects, including undergraduate and graduate thesis from different survey worldwide surveys, include the ESS, and reports from weird watchers on the eBird platform. Next. Next. I will present three of the stopover sites where the greatest abundance of the wind are recorded in the country. The Cienaga de los Oliditos is a wildlife refuge in the west of the country in Zulia State that is adjacent to the Salina Solar Los Oliditos, a Western international site. 29 species of shorebirds had been recorded in the site with record of up to uh, 54,000 individuals of Western and semi palmated sandpiper. There are records of wimbrels every month of the year with a maximum count of 280 individuals in February uh, 2010. Also registering abundance higher than 1% of biographical population of American oyster catcher, short bearded dog witchers and widgets. We're working with the local ONG Mangley for its nomination as a Western site. This, the next please, the site is characterized by having a large extension of mangroves and intertidal mud flats, as well as salt marshes, salt flats, and sand flats. Next. Punta Maraguay and Punta Caiman are two sites within Falcon State with record of 19 species of shorebirds with abundance of 5,000 individuals in March 2019. The abundance of wimbrel on this site peak counts of 123 individuals. Next. These sites are characterized by the presence of extensive intertidal mudflat mangroves sand flats and allophytic herbaceous harasslands with an abundance of feeder crabs. In the sites, the presence of one of the wind tracking was the satellite radio, Sashem was recorded, which reminded from September 2017 to April 2020. Three species, red knot, black bellied plover, and with some plover had abundance over 1% biogeographical population. So we're working for the nomination as a Western site, the Punta Caiman and Punta Maraguay. Next. In the east of the country, in Nueva Esparta State, one of the top over sites in the Margarita Island is Punta de Mangle. This site, together with the Los Maritas Natural Monument and La Ristinga National Park has been studied by researchers from the Universidad de Oriente and the Venezuelan Institute of Scientific Research, with several undergraduate theses developed on shorebirds. In Punta de Mangle have been registered 27 species of shorebird with up to 8,000 individuals in 2011. The wimbrels had been recorded almost all year with maximum counts of 65 individuals. Next. The site is characterized by the presence of a significant area of mangrove swamps as well as an intertidal mudflat, presented higher abundance of semi palmated sandpiper during the fall and, mi and spring migration. Next. Several threats has been, have been identified at the different stopover sites, but one of the threats along the entire coast of the country are oil spills. In, in 2019, we detected a spill in Punta Caiman, and in 2020, the Falcon State was very affected, particularly near Punta Maraguay and Punta Caiman. Next. The image that I show you now, the intertidal mud flat in Punta Caiman, contaminated by oil from the oil pipeline that over through this site is the direction in the direction, sorry, 
of the Punta Cardón refinery in the Baraguana Peninsula. Next, all, all these images are the same place in, in Punta Caimán in different months and different years. We, can, we, we could see the uh, spill over the mud flat still in different times of the last year and the year before. Next. Same place. Next. In March 2019, we observed several individuals of shorebeer species with oil plumage. And in October 2020, several fluid oil shorebeers were seen in the bay of Amway, next to another refinery in Paraguana. These oil spill were continuous since August 9, 2020, and sadly, still visible in satellite image in January 2021. For now, we don't know the direct effect of the oil spill that occurred last year. We have not been able to go to the field due to the COVID restrictions and transportation problems due to the gasoline stage, shortage. Pardon. Hopefully, this year we will have more chances of reaching Punta Maraguay and Punta Caiman. So if you have some questions, I can provide more information about other sites that are also important for shorebirds and especially for windbirds. Thank you. All right, Sandra, thank you so much. Um, I encourage all you who are listening to think about whether you have any questions for Sandra and feel free to enter them into the, the question box. And we have Manamet staff at Vianney Ramirez joining us as well to help with any translation. Um, if there's anything complicated you wanna ask that she'll help translate to Sandra and we can continue that at the end of the presentation. But I hope that was illuminating and painting the picture of the black box that we often think of when the birds leave Massachusetts and where do they go? And at least for some of the wimbrels that uh, spend the fall here in Massachusetts, they're heading to Venezuela and Sandra is a great person to be able to share that with us. And so in addition to those birds that flew down to South America, one of them, we additionally tagged one adult wimbrel. The majority of the birds we've tagged have been juveniles and that has been because that's kind of a missing link and our understanding of Wimbrel and shorebird behavior in general is how juveniles are behaving during their first years of life. How long are they on their wintering grounds? And then how do they behave on their subsequent uh, migration cycle? But in addition to wanting to understand a Wimbrel resource use and on Cape Cod, we additionally tagged an adult bird. And the benefit of doing that is that they are often pumping through their entire migratory cycle in a single year. And so after flying south to South America, as this bird here on the right is Ahanu, which you might've heard of, this is the track of Ahanu, an adult bird we tagged in September of 2018. Ahanu flew down and stopped on the coast of the Guyanas and then eventually moved down to Baia San Marcos, Brazil, and then flew subsequently on another nonstop flight all the way to the coast of Texas the following April. And this is actually a photograph of the um, management area in Freeport, Texas that the uh, land manager there was able to e email me. I emailed them and told them about Ahanu and they went out and actually photographed the impoundment where uh, Ahanu spent over a month and actually returned to the same impoundment the following spring. And then similarly, um, Ahanu flew up nonstop once again over the center, central, central part of the country up to a previously unknown breeding ground area for Wimbrel, which is uh, in the process of being published along with our partners at uh, Center for Conservation Biology and Georgia DNR. And this is actually a photograph. I did some sleuthing online and actually through eBird was able to find someone who had eBirded Wimbrel on the Thelon River, which is just about 20 kilometers from Ahanu's breeding site. And he had happened to take some photographs of the landscape. So I emailed him and he was able to email me some photographs of what 
the land actually looks like there. And so that's the Thelon River in Northwest Territories, uh, less than 20 kilometers from where Ahanu bred and then returned to breed uh, this past summer. And it's actually only about within about 50 kilometers or so of an additional Wimbrel that was tagged by our partners in the Canadian Maritimes about five years ago. And those two birds are helping delineate this new um, breeding area. And I'm telling this story because then Ahanu returned back to Massachusetts the following year in September. And as you can see here in this inset in the top right, the transmitter just happened to be transmitting. They transmit for five hours out of every 25 hours. It happened to be transmitting when the bird approached Massachusetts. And you can see it did a little bit of a U-turn over Martha's Vineyard and then flew in to that roost site that we had identified in Monomoy before then hopping back up to Wellfleet and doing and staying in the Wellfleet Jeremy Point area. And I show this full annual cycle to bring us back to Massachusetts after a year's worth of knowledge and to introduce Mark Faraday from, from uh, Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary where he has um, been the longtime science coordinator there as well as being heavily involved in just the general ornithology and uh, bird scene on Cape Cod. And so we're gonna welcome Mark in here and then I've got a couple open-ended questions kind of to help stimulate conversation with him. And then additionally, he will be able to um, be available at the end of the uh, presentation to answer any additional questions you might have. So I'm gonna, so you should be able to see Mark and myself here. Welcome, Mark. Welcome, thank you. I thought Mark would be the perfect person to kind of give the perspective of uh, someone who's heavily embedded in the scientific work of the Wellfleet area in Cape Cod and is very good at sharing that information with the public through his various avenues. And so I just kind of tee you up first, Mark, with asking as the science coordinator what the what's the value of scientific research, both on Wimbrel and just in general uh, in the Wellfleet area and on Cape Cod and what are kind of the, the pressing issues that you know, research like this can help shed light on. Yes, um, thank you for that question that I totally didn't have access to in advance. Uh, <laughs> no, thanks, Alan and, and Brad and Manamet. Um, I'm glad this is happening. I'm glad this many people are, are wanting to hang out and talk about shorebirds, especially one of my favorite ones, if not, if not my favorite one. Um, how can you not like Wimbrels? I mean, they're just amazing. And um, <clears throat> I'll get to it later, but it, it's, our, it's our logo bird at Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary where I work for, for Mass Audubon. Um, but getting to the, the importance of this research and how it fits in with um, what's going on on the Cape, it, it, it's really, um, Wimbrels are different than other shorebirds in terms of how dependent they are on salt marshes. Um, you know, you think about sanderlings and some of these other more abundant shorebirds that can hang out on beaches and, and mud flats and things, and they're in these big flocks. Um, but wimbrels are much more specific and very much tied to not just salt marshes, but salt marshes with fiddler crabs, you know, healthy salt marshes with um, good populations of, of fiddler crabs. Um, and salt marsh health is probably the most important arguably conservation issue here on Cape Cod. When you think about salt marshes, it's hard to overstate their, their importance to every aspect of the Cape economically. I mean, if you run a kayak business, if you're a shell fisherman, um, if you run a restaurant, anything that depends on tourism, if you're us at, at Wellfleet Bay, if you're a commercial fisherman offshore, um, you know, the salt marshes are the nursery grounds for all kinds of commercially important things from lobsters to finfish. Um, and so this research really um, it is important to understanding salt marshes. I mean, I've been watching, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's happening with wimbrels. You know, I feel like I used to be able to see over 150 around, around Wellfleet Harbor back in late 90s, early 2000s. And I was just going back and looking at some data in eBird, including Manomet old uh, International Shorebird Survey data. I mean, talk about the importance of long-term research and, and the work that Manomet's been doing. Um, 
you know, those are the, that's the only data available for numbers of wimbrels, say, in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And back then, there were, sometimes people could get 500, 600 or more wimbrels, places like North Monomoy, um, used to be able to get 150 at the sanctuary as recently as, as the late 90s. Nobody's seeing numbers like that anymore. I saw one total over 100 in the last like 20 years. So, um, you know, they seem to be declining. And, and so is that because of the habitat declining? And certainly our salt marshes are really imperiled here in Wellfleet in particular um, for a variety of reasons, but one of them is an invasive crab. Uh, not really invasive. Um, it's a it's a native crab, kind of mysterious. In the past, um, gained a little bit more fame because it is denuding our salt marshes and threatening what is the most important ecosystem here on the Cape. And it's something that keeps me up at night. Our our salt marshes at the sanctuary around Lieutenant Island, where you guys have been working, um, have really declined. Um, the Spartina patens is disappearing. The crabs actually have a role in that their burrows kind of hasten the demise of, of the salt marsh and that they Swiss cheese the, the substrate and that allows big chunks of salt marsh to calve off. So but I'm sort of rambling, but everything is connected. Um, and I have a lot of questions about what's going on out there. And at Mass Audubon, you know, we don't do tons of pure research. And so it's important to me as a, as a scientist and to Mass Audubon as well to partner with organizations like Manomet, pure researchers like Brad and Alan. <clears throat> I think you guys are pure, you're pretty pure. Um, <laughs> um, to get at some of these questions, you know, we're very good at land conservation, land protection, and, and especially education, engaging the public um, with these stories, these conservation stories, getting people excited about conserving things like wimbrels and, and salt marshes. Um, and and the wimbrel is a charismatic species, you know, at least I think so. I mean, just someone might say, well, it's a, it's a brown bird, it's chicken sized. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I think it's pretty easy to sell wimbrels and the amazing migration story that they have. And this work that you guys are doing, <clears throat> producing those maps, the wow factor of the satellite technology, <clears throat> um, we can bring that into the schools and the work that we do in the schools to try to get kids excited. And that's a big part of our mission is getting the next generation excited about um, conservation. Um, you know, kids can learn about geography. Uh, I mean, these birds are seeing more of the world than just about anybody you went to high school with. Um, and so the connection to fiddler crabs, um, there's just a lot for us to talk about here. And, and I enjoy getting some of the mysteries that we've always had unraveled, like where do they go at night? And you guys have been able to get at some of those questions with these satellite tags. And there's nothing like satellite tracking your study species. I've been involved in a few, a few studies like this and just being able to bring up a map and, and see where your critters are and, and, and know what they're doing is so cool. And so learning that they um, use Jeremy Point as, a, as a, both a stopover and <clears throat> as a bedroom, as Alan said, is important. Um, and all of this can tie into conservation decisions um, that are happening at the local level, whether it's with the National Park Service and how they manage Jeremy Point or how we manage our salt marshes. Um, and so uh, it, it's all really important to us and, and um, I'm glad that we can partner with or at least facilitate, I would say, is, is what we're doing here is, is helping to facilitate this work as they, as they do the trapping on, on Lieutenant Island um, and elsewhere out here. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, you were throw, throwing out some of the numbers of uh, some of the larger Wimbrel numbers that have occurred in the past. And just to give some perspective, with, while also not trying to be doom and gloom, there's the largest um, count of Wimbrel in Massachusetts actually occurred in 1833 on Nantucket and it was a count of 1500 Wimbrel. Mm -hmm. And just if you think that's a lot, you can also read some old stories and there's counts of 5,000 Eskimo curlews on the <laughs> Cape as well. So you thought the Wimbrels were abundant on the Cape, you can um, think of that. And then also records of dozens of long-billed curlews stopping over in the fall. and Wow. Wimbrel are still common enough that they are easily studied. 
and they're representative of this imperiled group of globally imperiled group of shorebirds called curlews, even though the name curlew is not in the Wimbrel's name, that are declining across the board and are some of the most imperiled species or already extinct species within the group of shorebirds. Um, and thanks also, Mark, for pointing out and just the importance of salt marshes as a nursery for wildlife, but also really the nursery of the local economy in many respects of whether it's the, the fisheries and the protection of absorbing storms and all sorts of things and how studying something that's emblematic of the salt marsh is really also studying everything about the Cape. And with a few minutes that we have uh, left, left Mark, I just, it is kind of unique situation where a lot of our research is actually occurring on a wildlife sanctuary that is also a place that is welcomes the public and so that some people on the call might not be aware of that and might be interested in realizing that they can actually go out and visit in person this site where a lot of this research is going on. So if you could just share a couple minutes about what the sanctuary has to offer in terms of being outdoors and seeing birds and also any ed educational infrastructure you have on, on site that might be of interest to the audience. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, yes, uh, I so, we are Bass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary, and um, we've restructured. We're now part of what's known as the Cape Cod Hub, which includes our Long Pasture Sanctuary and Barnstable, but uh, we, we still are our Wellfleet Bay Sanctuary, and um, it's still, I think, the best place in Massachusetts in terms of easily accessible places to see Wimbrel, um, even though they, they have declined. Um, you know, either at our sanctuary proper or at the Lieutenant Island Bridge, which is salt marsh that we own that's um, accessible from a different place. But yes, come to the sanctuary, um, walk our trails. We do programs, or at least in a normal year, we, we would, um, <laughs> would hopefully we'll have uh, our usual slate of offerings at, at some point um, in this upcoming summer, but we have all kinds of public programs, day camp for over a thousand kids. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what those things look like for this year, just like everybody else in the world, uh, but in a normal year. But yes, we're, certainly our trails are still open now. And if you come in, in like mid-July, end of July, it, it, often when the peak numbers of Wimbrel are around, and that, but they're there into October, um, and, and you can see them feasting on fiddler crabs. And another reason I like this research, um, this is core... Mass Audubon stuff and, and Core Wellfleet Bay stuff. This, the sanctuary was an important bird research station long before it even became a Mass Audubon property. Dr. Oliver Austin, a prominent ornithologist back in the early 20th century, published tons of research on um, mostly with his banding work on, on terns and shorebirds and things. And so it was a real um, bird research clearinghouse back then this property. And so, um, you know, this is part of our origin story as a property. So it's, it's good to keep that going with some, some more banding studies and, and shorebird research. Great, thank you. Um, we might be hearing more from Mark at the end, um, but we're gonna continue on and be bringing in Brad Wynn, which if any of you know Manomet and Shorebirds, you probably know Brad. And Brad is the Director of Shorebird Habitat Management at Manomet and also uh, one of the leaders of our shorebird work. And so welcome, Brad. I'm sure you've been chomping at the bit to be able to talk about a bird that you love and actually have helped introduce into Manomet's portfolio of work. And so I thought I'd start right there and ask you to tell a little bit the story of how Manomet has got introduced or has got involved in researching Wimbrel over the last decade plus and a little bit of uh, your backstory and how you were instrumental in making that happen uh, and continue to this day. Sure, hi Alan, hey everybody. Uh, thanks for doing all this Alan, this is going well and, and gosh, thanks to our, 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 our honored panelists with Sandra and with Mark on here. It's really great. Uh, it's kind of representative what what uh, Manimit does um, and and how we're able to work. But uh, 
so to, to, to answer your question, uh, Manhood actually with Wimbrel has been involved for since the 80s when uh, the, the, some of the first work on the species was done out of Manomet. Um, and, uh, and Betsy Mallory was on staff then. She actually was a co-author of the Birds of North America um, uh, for, for Wimbrel. So you can, you can find some of the work uh, that she was involved with uh, listed there in, that, in the document. But yeah, in the last, um, whew, let's see, yeah, last 10 years actually, isn't it? Um, we've been working with Wimbrels uh, on the Cape and also continuing work in Georgia. And Alan and I are headed actually to the Gulf of Mexico uh, this spring to continue some um, surveys down there. As you saw, some of our Atlantic Flyway birds are actually going over to, to uh, Texas, Louisiana uh, area on the, on the Gulf Coast. So, um, but uh, gosh, I, I've been staring at Wimbrose for a, for a long time. And then when the technology that you've mentioned came up uh, back in uh, 2008, 2009, uh, when I was in Georgia working for the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, we uh, really wanted to get involved with tracking the birds that were coming into Georgia each spring in large numbers. We didn't know anything about what they were doing outside of our little window, as you've mentioned several times. So, um, uh, so we, we uh, the, the, that project came north with me when I came to start a work for Manhattan about 2011, and we've been growing it ever since. Um, I wanted to just to uh, be as brief as possible here to leave people some time for questions. Um, and any of this that we've been talking about, we can follow up on. A little bit, but I, I did want to emphasize while we're on here the importance of of uh, partners like you've seen today with Manomet, and that's how we're able to do what we do. It's because we work with a large suite of professionals throughout the Americas uh, for on many species, including uh, Wimbrel. So a lot of credit needs to go to the the groups of the individuals that we work with uh, throughout the flyway. So we do some of the uh, the, the, the science, the investigations of, of what these birds need and where they go. And then we rely on the people that are on the ground there, uh, both north of us into Canada and Alaska and all the way south throughout South America as well. So I just wanted to put a plug in for the partnerships we have. Thanks, Brad. Um, that is a good point that, believe it or not, we're almost already 50 minutes into our webinar and want to make sure that we um, continue the kind of conversational atmosphere that we are looking to have in this webinar rather than a monologue presentation and to be able to get some questions from you all and continue the conversation. I'm going to just see, highlight just very briefly some of the additional kind of partnership-based work that we're, we do at Manomet. As Brad mentioned, we have a lot of ties to Georgia and a lot relating to Wimbrel, but then also uh, we have Abby Sterling, who's a shorebird scientist based in there doing all, all sorts of things. And we're tying into bigger things that work that we do locally or then tied into um, initiatives that involving conserving Wimbrel and other shorebirds uh, throughout their flyways. And you can learn more about this on our website, but this webinar is more about Wimbrels and so a quick shout out to some supporters, which, of which there's several, and then open it up to questions. And I believe what we'll do actually is um, we'll stop sharing the screen now and just open up uh, the camera of everyone, all the panelists who participated and, and perhaps Emily on the call will help select some of the questions and uh, ask them to us and we'll fight over who gets to answer them. And I just wanted to point out that um, after seeing Mark's nice Wimbrel background there, I had to go get a whole flock of them just to just to let you know. I had to go find them in the that's the salt marsh in Mel Wellfleet, by the way. Photo wasn't even from Wellfleet, it was from Nosset Marsh. Uh-oh. Well, well, I feel I've got the real thing in my background though. <laughs> Perched on my shoulder. All right, uh, thank you all. Um, that was a super fascinating presentation. Um, I'm gonna take over and field some questions. My name is Emily and I'm Manomet's communications coordinator. 
So we did get a lot of questions and we might not be able to get to all of them, but I do want to um, encourage those of you who don't have your questions answered to um, feel free to reach out to any of our panelists um, and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to um, answer your questions offline. Um, but first, we had several questions um, asking about uh, breeding. Um, at what age do wimbrels breed? Do they stay on their wintering sites until they reach breeding age? What months of the year do they breed? Um, so maybe one or several of you could give a, an overview of, of wimbrel breeding habits. Um, sure, I can, I can say some, and then if um, Brad wants to hop in and add anything, he's welcome to. Um, one, of the, one of the questions inside of there is actually at, at the crux of kind of the, what began our research with Wimbrel on the Cape, and that was to focus on um, the maturation of juvenile Wimbrel during their first few years and to figure out how long they're on the wintering grounds and then how they behave once they begin migrating northward. And we have been able to answer some of those questions. We had one uh, bird, Chatham, that actually spent mul two, cal two full calendar years, three full calendar years in the British Virgin Islands before flying north. And so that was actually very delayed, sort of in mean, maturations, so to speak, where the bird is making a kind of a, a business decision of, is it worth the risk of migrating north and breeding as a one-year-old or two-year-old bird, or do I stay at a place and mature in the wintering grounds where there's lots of food and fairly secure? And some of our, the research that we've started to publish with our partners shows that a lot of the mortality of these wimbrels occurs during these long flights, and that if you're not going to be breeding on one of these at the end of one of these long flights, it might be better to hedge your bets and stay in your wintering grounds. And we've had another bird that just spent one additional calendar year on the wintering grounds and came north. So it does seem to be a, a conversely, a Hanu just spent a single winter and then is coming back north quite rapidly. And then um, the breeding season really doesn't commence in the far north until June. And it depends also some on how quickly the snow melts and the ground that they nest on becomes exposed that might even be delayed to the point where they might not be able to breed every year. And then, um, but then usually by late, late July, um, they're heading, heading back south again. And so it's really a very brief, extremely productive breeding, breeding season in the far north where there's a, a bloom of food resources, and berries and insects. And um, if they can breed, if the stars align, then they get it done and then are heading back back south in the blink of an eye. Um, Brad, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? No, just to emphasize the, the site fidelity of these adults, they go to some of the exact locations uh, in very similar flight pattern, or timing rather, um, throughout the year. So a limbro develops really four locations uh, in its migration uh, path. And unless there's a storm that comes in, like a hurricane that will interrupt the flight path of one of these birds, uh, they will be quite reliably on the same location uh, each year uh, throughout their, their adult lives. And we've been trying to work out what the juvenile birds are doing and how they figure out where those resources are as they're migrating. And that's what we're, we're most of our work on the Cape has been looking at uh, juvenile uh, uh, juvenile flights. We do I have to do another shout out to our partners. This is all done in, with a partnership in uh, the Center for Conservation Biology of William and Mary, uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service biologists, and then uh, Georgia DNR uh, biologists are still working with us on these. So just a few of the partners. That's all I've got. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, this question comes from Stuart. He says, I've read some sad stories about Nosset Marsh being devoid of fiddler crabs because of mosquito eradication attempts from a century ago. I kayak this marsh and don't see many wimbrels there, but wonder if fiddler crabs can be reintroduced there. Hmm. I think that's a Mark Faraday question, but I can, I can just throw out that fiddler crabs are not found in all the marshes of Massachusetts, I think naturally, based on 
location and and uh, and whether it's the open ocean or the bay. But but Mark, what do you know anything about that? Um, yeah, no, it's a good, it's a great question. <clears throat> they, um, the Sasarma crabs, there were several questions about what, what the crabs were that I was talking about. I could take this opportunity to answer that as well. But the, <clears throat> the obscure crab that is overgrazing the marshes around Wellfleet Bay and elsewhere on the Cape is called Sasarma reticulatum. It's a nocturnal herbivorous crab. They like, cl they literally climb up the stalks with these kind of beefy claws and just eat the marsh grass right down to the ground. They're also not in, in Nosset Marsh, so it's a better looking marsh. Um, look behind Brad. That that shouldn't be bare. That should not be bare mud. That that Swiss cheese look is all the old fiddler crab burrows. And then the lack of vegetation is some combination of the Sasarma crabs and sea level rise stressing the marsh. That should be vegetated. So this is this is one of the problems. But um, yeah, it's a good question about why the fiddler crabs are not in Nosset Marsh, and I don't know if it's definitively because of um, DDT um, or if it's just because, like Brad said, fiddler crabs are, um, the, the Cape is a, a biogeographic boundary um, for a lot of ranges of species naturally, and fiddler crabs have not historically occurred north of Cape Cod. Um, but they do now. They've colonized the North Shore in the last 20 years. and Everything is moving north as, as the waters get warmer. Um, but I don't know if you could, could or should introduce them to, to Nosset Marsh. That is just a little aside of um, the March North. It's a very interesting. One of the maybe future research questions here is birds that are stopping over on the Atlantic coast in Massachusetts are feeding on fiddler crabs, but then Wimbrel are also doing a similar thing in the Canadian Maritimes, stopping over there. And, but there they're eating, eating blueberries and fiddler crabs do not exist that far northward. And so there's kind of this shift at some point on the Atlantic coast where birds that are stopping over are learning how to eat fiddler crabs for the first time after eating berries and spiders in the Arctic. But then, as Mark alluded to, fiddler crabs are also steadily marching northward uh, as the climate warms and they current now exist in coastal New Hampshire, for example, and on the north shore of Massachusetts, whereas previously Cape Cod was kind of the northernmost outpost of fiddler crabs. And so it's kind of this major diet change that happens on the Atlantic coast and also at the same time, it's shifting northward. So it's an interesting thing that's happening before our eyes, kind of. Great. Um, so we might only have time for a couple more questions. Um, this one, I think, is for Sandra. Um, Sandra, what can be done to reduce or eliminate oil spills on the coast of Venezuela? And we do have Vianney who can. Voy a pedir ayuda a Vianney. Este, para responder. Eh, bueno, el problema de, las, de los derrames que están ocurriendo en el país es consecuencia que eh, las refinerías tienen, digamos, problemas con la infraestructura, falta de mantenimiento y no ha habido una, están tratando de ponerlas a funcionar y cada vez que las quieren poner a funcionar ocurren los derrames. Desde la sociedad civil y desde la academia se han hecho llamados, se, incluso se introdujo en la fiscalía una solicitud de investigación para ver si de esa manera se presiona a eh, la empresa que es PDVSA, que es una empresa del Estado, para que tome acciones y evite esas, eh, digamos, ese, esos derrames. Eh, Vianney? I'm going I'm to try to okay. translate a bit. Hi, everyone. My name is Vianney Ramirez. I'm the communications specialist for Wizard. Uh, okay, so Sandra said that basically all these oil spills has been due to a lack of maintenance and infrastructure problems in the oil factories. I don't know the name, sorry. Refinery. Refinery. And basically, um, right now, like all the social uh, oil, 
NGOs, university and social com and communities are making like, how do you say? They, they, they have been doing work to, to say, okay, this is happening, but uh, it's, it's not working right now. Like every time the refineries start working, uh, these things happen again because of the infrastructure problems. So, no sé si... ¿Sí? <laughs> sí, el, el, realmente hay, el problem, hay un problema que es que la empresa del Estado no está tomando la, digamos, los mecanismos para hacer la contingencia de los derrames que debería hacer. O sea, ellos okay. pudieran hacer la contingencia si tuvieran los equipos para ello y aparentemente no los tienen o no tienen el personal adecuado para hacerlo porque no están tomando pues, digamos que en los sitios en donde han ocurrido los derrames si tuvieran el equipo pudieran hacer la contención y no se está haciendo entonces lo que suponemos es eso porque la empresa no ha dicho nada no sabemos ni siquiera el tipo de hidrocarburo que está siendo derramado porque no no han no han dado ninguna explicación ni ningún comunicado. Entonces, que lo que podemos hacer en este momento es denunciar. Es lo único que hemos podido hacer. Y en caso, digamos, eh, no tenemos personal que esté entrenado para tratar aves que estén petroleadas. Entonces, eso también es un gran problema que hay en la actualidad. Este, y bueno, más unido al hecho que ahorita es muy difícil acceder a los sitios por la circunstancia de restricciones de movilización y por la escasez de gasolina que hace que se dificulte también el desplazamiento. Okay, so the main reason of this big problem is because of the government like uh, institution that is in charge of controlling this and doing their work to repair or mitigate some of the yeah, yeah so the results of the oil spills. Uh, is not doing their, their jobs. So most of these places continue to have oil spills. So right now, Sandra suggests that what we can do is just keep up telling everyone that this is happening to create some pressure so the government can do something about it. And another problem right now is that there is no one to take care of the birds that have been oiled. So They, they don't have the equipment, the knowledge, and also it's difficult to access the places due to COVID restrictions. And also there is a shortage of oil in the country in general. So it's really hard to reach those places. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so we are just about out of time. We went a couple of minutes over. I wanted to once again, thank all of the panelists for an awesome presentation. It was very interesting um, and we hope that everybody enjoyed and we thank everybody who was able to attend today uh, for joining in and for bringing your questions and taking part in our conversation. Uh, I know that many of you are longtime supporters of Manimet and for that we want to thank you. Um, we are so grateful for your generosity and for your commitment to the work that we do. Um, we hope to see you again on a future webinar. So uh, please do keep an eye on your email for info on upcoming programs. And a reminder that this webinar presentation was recorded and you will receive an email with a link to view this webinar uh, within the next 24 hours. Um, so thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day. And um, feel free to, if you have any questions that we weren't able to get to, um, feel free to email uh, myself or anyone else you can get the email of. And I can also forward questions to Mark and Sandra. If you have questions for them, I can be the, the question DJ. And my email is just A-K-N-E-I-D-E-L at manamet.org.